who is the most underrated actor of all time? It's Dolph Lundgren. Correct. Why? Well, because of his uh, spiky hair, yeah. his ice cold demeanor, and his big muscles. Absolutely. I must break you. Welcome to I Must Break This Podcast. This is the fan podcast celebrating the cinematic career of action legend Dolph Lundgren. Hello and welcome back to I Must Break This Podcast. The fan podcast that celebrates the films of action icon Dolph Lundgren. I'm your host Sean Malloy and today is another special bonus episode. Now, before we get to today's interview, I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone who has graciously appeared on the show over the course of the past year. A year ago, I started up this show as the ultimate tribute to one of my favorite action stars of all time, Dolph Lundgren. Over the course of the year, I've had the privilege of building some great friendships and getting in touch with many who've had a hand in working alongside Lundgren himself. From actors to writers and directors, it has been an absolute honor for a fan like myself to speak with so many who've had a hand in helping make some of my most cherished films. So as we mark this one year anniversary, I wanted to say thank you to every one of my co-hosts, as well as all of the interviewees who I've chatted with. This has truly been a dream come true, and I couldn't be more excited to seeing the show continue to grow. Now, on to today's episode. Recently, I had the pleasure of speaking with the ultimate man of action, Anthony DeLongis. DeLongis is a true renaissance man. He's an actor, stuntman, horseman, voice actor, and fight choreographer with expertise in bladed weapons, the bullwhip, and mounted horseback. DeLongis has trained some of the biggest names in Hollywood, including Harrison Ford, Michelle Pfeiffer, Jet Li, Angelica Houston, Bo Derek, Placido Domingo, and Tom Cruise. Fans of the genre may know DeLongis best as the character Blade, the bounty hunter swordsman hired by the villainous Skeletor to track down the heroic He-Man in 1987's Masters of the Universe. In addition to starring in the film, DeLongis also trained He-Man himself, Dolph Lundgren, for the film's sword fights and the epic final battle in the film. Clearly, Anthony DeLongis has a storied career that could be a podcast in itself, thanks to his numerous stories and experiences. So it was an honor being able to speak with this legend of action cinema. DeLongis and I discuss his early days practicing sword mechanics, working on Masters of the Universe, instructing novices in the art of the bullwhip, and his very own Fortress of Solitude, Rancho Indalo, located in Canyon Country, California. Here, DeLongis teaches amateurs to professionals how to be an action hero, or, at the very least, look like one on camera. I hope you enjoy your discussion as much as I did. So, for your listening pleasure is my conversation with action legend Anthony DeLongis on I Must Break This Podcast. First of all, um, I wanted to say thank you so, so very much for uh, taking the time to speak with a fan today. I really do appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate, I, I appreciate your uh, being a fan. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm starting to run across people who have... Uh, no idea, you know, when I start referencing, you know, well, have you seen this? Have you seen this? You know, and I may as well be referencing, you know, John Ford or Akira Kurosawa movies because they have no idea what I'm talking about. But, oh, great. I've lived long enough to where, uh, you know, anybody under 30 doesn't know what the hell I've done in my career. <laughs> oh, man, that's a shame. That's a shame. I mean, because you have had a, a quite an impressive and storied career. And I think I was telling you this when you and I spoke yeah, a, a couple weeks back, just the fact that I honestly feel like you have been living the dream of every 10-year-old boy. I mean, my, my little boy, for example, he's going to be three here in a couple months, and he he loves swords. I mean, everything, he, if we're walking along, he sees a stick, he picks it up, that's a sword. And then if he finds a pillow, that's a shield. I mean, and just the fact that you, you get to, uh, you're paid for playing with weapons, essentially, Sometimes. and showing those weapons. That's awesome. Sometimes. I, yeah. uh, I'll be careful because that's kind of how I started. Okay. <laughs> with, with all that, um, yeah, I was not, well, <laughs> I, uh, oh, I grew up on, um, you know, Robin Hood and, uh, the Mark of Zorro with Tyrone Power and, uh, oh, my fencing master was Basil Rathbone's teacher. My fencing master was, uh, Maestro Ralph Faulkner. He's, 
he was a two-time Olympian, and he was the sword master of the stars here in Hollywood. He, uh, oh, he did the original Prisoner of Zenda with Ronald Coleman, and uh, he's Doug Fairbanks Jr.'s coach, and he was um, Basil Rathbone's coach. And, you know, he coached a lot of Olympians, and um, uh, but he he was he was the first of the great teachers in my life, and um, I studied with him for over a dozen years. As a matter of fact, there's a statue that was made of him that used to be in the school, Falcon Studios. Um, he and his wife, Edith Jane, who was a pretty famous dancer and dance instructor about the same time as Agnes DeMille. And um, they had a studio together. And this statue, um, slightly larger than life, although so was Ralph, um, he was referred to as the boss, you know, by his students. Um, but it's it's in my living room. I, uh, you know, was blessed with inheriting that so you know, he's, he's an inspiration every day and then the other great teacher that really had a huge effect on me was uh guru dan in asanto i trained with him for over a decade and between the two of them um that's how i created my whip system my you know speak the longest rolling loop most people yank and crank you know and force the whip and i align the whip and i roll and stab so it's more efficient. It's um, I think it's more accurate because it literally stabs. Um, I have safety factors built into it, and it's a whole lot prettier. You know, I came up with it when I was um, training Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman, and I wanted something that was alluring and hypnotic but obviously dangerous and powerful like her character. And then I've been evolving it ever since. So, uh, And <laughs> it's more than proven itself. I, I flew in the face of tradition, you know. Of course, the, the number of dumb things that are done in the name of tradition is, uh, you know, is legendary. But uh, uh, it has now been, I don't know, almost 32 years I've been doing this. And, you know, I've been doing it on in horrible conditions on sets and on horseback and everywhere else. And I have more than proven it, doggone it. And <laughs> it was very funny um, that there have been some scientific articles that talk about the conservation of uh, – Oh, uh, lateral energy and, um, you know, the which is at the heart of my system. I didn't know that, of course. I just kind of taught myself to listen to the whip and going, these people are working too hard, you know. The martial arts ideal is maximum return for minimum effort. And um, that whole yank and crank thing just seemed like, eh. It's designed to make a big noise, but that's that's the lowest bar you can set with a whip. But I was very fascinated with it, thanks to Indiana Jones and, this are all the gay blades, so I ended up teaching myself, and that's why I don't do it like everybody else. To me, it's like a flexible sword, so I okay. have a sword background with it, and then um, the Filipino footwork, you know, showed me the multiple angles, which is essentially the same as rapier footwork, but um, so looking at it as a supersonic telescopic blade, um, my perception of it was different, so the way I do it was different, and it's... I'm very excited. Um, it's a 5,000-year-old tool. It's the first man-made tool to break the sound barrier. dates to 3,000 B.C. that we know of in both the Chinese and Egyptian cultures, and every culture that ever domesticated animals has had a whip of some sort. And then man being man, you know, goes, wow, what a great tool. Hey, this could be a weapon. <laughs> so, and, yes, it, it's, uh, it's a very effective weapon, too. Well, no, and I, I wanted to ask you, you know, you are an expert in – swords and knives and whips and i'm curious is there a particular weapon or instrument that you enjoy using and teaching more than the others or are they all are they, do they all have a special place in your heart when i said be careful with your boy because that's how i started with <laughs> every stick is, is a sword and yeah um well my favorite single-handed weapon is saber i've been studying shinkendo under uh kaiso toshishiro obata and with my sensei matthew lynch for 10 years now um, Kurosawa films are what got me into choreography back in the 70s and I feel like I've come full circle because you know I've I've been able to uh, in 1984 I did the 50 year um, anniversary uh, production of Rashomon which started as a stage play and um, uh, at the Old Globe Theater in San Diego which was where I began my career with Shakespeare and um I, I used to be able to, uh, if, uh, I, I could fake it. Uh, I, I, it looks really cool, but now I actually know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> so yeah. that's, 
I'm always trying to add to my knowledge because knowledge is choices and your art is in your choices. And the more things you know, the more the more the ideas come. I think that that phrase of luck favors the prepared. Well, you know, keep learning something. It uh, it keeps you as young as you know. Uh, well, most of my body's still pretty young, but uh, I I've got a mantra. It's like if I'm not if I'm not getting better, I'm just getting older. And there's only one of those things I can actually do anything about. So I'm always trying to learn. Uh, as far as flexible weapons go, I love the whip. I particularly like the bull whip, but, uh, you know, it, it is a foundation for any flexible weapon I pick up. I can do probably 80% of it with a belt or a or a scarf or, you know, a sash or a piece of extension cord or a rope. The thing about a whip is it has an inner braided core. It has a skeleton, which is why it looks like a cat's tail or a snake. So the energy that you introduce to it is is multiplied by its construction, which is at the core of what I do with it. So to answer your question, saber, katana, and whip. <laughs> okay. And, and now you are, I mean, you, you are an instructor, so you are teaching people, would you say, just about every day of the week? Are you are you instructing classes? Um, not every day of the week. Well, it depends. Um, people come from all over the country. My, my school here, is, they, they told me I had to come up with a cool name, so I call it DIPACA, which is the longest performance in combat arts. Um Everything I do to, comes from a combative uh, background, you know, based on the things I've studied with, you know, people like Maestro Faulkner and Rodan and Asanto and Kaiser Toshishiro Bata. So I'm not making up nonsense techniques, but then I've taken and um, depending on – so I, basically I can teach somebody from a martial standpoint or I can teach them from a performance standpoint. But it all comes from the same construction, and I find that each um, – both both arts uh, complement the other. Uh, performance arts complement how you present your information and how you uh, impart it to students um, because you're essentially uh, slowing things down so that they can um, recognize, you know, the, the control of the weapon, the control of distance, the control of timing, uh, the sensitivity of the partner's energy, you know, and all of these other choices that... Uh, this, um, but it's the same thing I utilize when I'm trying to create the illusion of combat um, by slowing it down and opening it up. Uh, I help the audience recognize the jeopardy for the character, uh, but it's coming from. I try as hard as I can to create what would be the correct. Uh, the, the choices I've made are combative. I try to create the ad, the environment, and the energy for that to be a logical choice for the audience to see. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, when you're okay, so let's, let's say, for example, you know, I'm, I'm a regular, I'm a regular average guy, and I, I go to your school and I want to learn how to how to operate one of these weapons. What are some of the first steps that you take in teaching a novice? in handling one of these weapons, whether it be a sword, a dagger, a whip, whatever it may be. Ah, it's funny you ask that. Uh, but let me finish your other question. Um, for, well, people come to Rancho and Dollar. This is where my school is. My school is in my home. We're at top of a mountain. Oh, just over the hill from Vasquez Rocks, which is, you know, where Kirk battled the Gorn and what was Planet Vulcan and all that. You know, that, uh, that amazing geological, um, how should we put this, uh, the power of nature. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Anyway, we're we're, we're like 45 minutes north of Universal Studios, but I'm three miles up a dirt road. So, um, this is where my school is, and that's where I teach the European weapons and the Filipino weapons and the Japanese weapons. And we have literally hundreds of acres of amazing cross country riding because we're back in this little nature enclave, and I've got an onsite gun range and. So I can, there's a lot of things. Oh, we've got an archery range and a knife and tomahawk throwing range. I'm in the um, International Knife Throwers Hall of Fame and the Black Belt Hall of Fame, which are all nice little incentives. But, um, so yeah, training at Rancho and Dalo. Uh, um, when someone comes in, like I've got a client uh, coming in the end of the month uh, from New York, and then he'll be followed by a client coming in from Paris who's, this will be his, fourth time training with us, with us, I think. And every summer we get the Australian Sun Academy come in for like 12 days um, for intensive training. This will be, 
oh my goodness, this will be their 12th year. Um, so it depends if people are local, you know, people come in and train, if people um, live out of state or, you know, out of the country or want to do intensive training, you know, three to five days to ten, you know, two, you know, ten days, whatever they, they want to do. Uh, the more time I have, the more I can teach somebody. But I'm, uh, I'm essentially teaching, I'm teaching you how to keep teaching yourself, how to keep training. But to get to your next question, um, yes, there is a, there, there's weapon specific adjustments that maximize the effectiveness of each tool and that reference a particular culture. Uh, each weapon has its advantages and its strengths and each one has its vulnerabilities. But at the core of all of them, there is a structural foundation and that's, that's what I teach. Um, I'm, I'm in the business of being able to impart information quickly uh, and accurately because working in movies, Usually, time is what you don't have. So um, I have uh, distilled, if you will. Um, it's, a, it's a structural foundation. And, you know, in, in brief, your hand is behind your weapon, your elbow's behind your hand, your body's behind your elbow. If your body's behind your elbow, you have strength through structure rather than effort, rather than muscle. And it's, um, have you ever punched anything? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, or have you done knuckle push-ups? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, when you do that, you have to have skeletal alignment. You have to have your wrist lined up with your fist and your elbow lined up with your wrist, and you have to have your body behind your elbow, or you have a weakness in your structure, and you'll all the all that energy goes back into you. That punch that you were trying to hit the bag or an opponent with goes into your wrist. It stops at your wrist if your wrist bends. So you break your wrist. Um, so that that idea of um, your footwork is uh, there's a okay there's eight angles of attack with with a blade um, verticals horizontal forehand and back end descending diagonals forehand and back end and ascending diagonal makes an asterisk if you visualize that okay and you can cut or thrust along those lines you can reverse the line there's all kinds of combinations. But if you want to um, distill things to a foundational truth, there's only eight angles. You could say there's 360, but let's say eight. Are you picturing that? Yes. Yeah. Now, that's what, that's what your tool is doing. If, if you don't have a tool, then your body is your striking surface, your fists, your elbows, your knees, your legs. Um, but you're still working within those eight angles. Uh, some people are able to work their feet in all of those angles. <laughs> there was a time. Uh, now I kind of let my hands do the upstairs and then the feet do the bottom. Um, but there, there's that. But if I have a tool, now the tool does that. And the tool is an extension of me. Um, one of the first things I teach people is without you, the tool is an inanimate object. Once you pick it up, now it's an extension of you, of your will and your skill. But it works for you. It's the tool isn't what's important. That tool is just something that makes your intention easier. Okay, um, so that's uh, there's there's eight angles of attack. Then then you have your footwork. Your footwork is your delivery system and your escape route. Uh, and there are eight angles. There's forward and back. That's linear. And there's all kinds of ways. Like in modern fencing, you've got advances and crossovers and patinandas and balusters and lunges. Um, this is just different ways of uh, moving forward and back. You follow? Along yeah. Line. Okay, then you have lateral movement, which is get out of the way, step to the side, or profile yourself, or do that. Then you have descending diagonals, which is build a barrier, preferably with a tool, like you're going to parry. So if you build a barrier and get behind, get your body behind your elbow, you're able to withstand great force because um, your entire body is meeting and absorbing that force as opposed to just the strength of your hand. You follow? Okay. Right. Those are your descending angles. Your ascending angles are letting something, letting the attacker go where he wants to go. Don't be there. So you monitor with the blade. You leave the blade in center line and you move either to the outside or the inside of the attack. That's ascending diagonal. So once again, we have eight angles. And then there's one other aspect is a circle. If I move to the left and you counter to the left, nothing has changed. The Spanish call it the lineus infinitus, which is the line of infinity. That's what I did when I did uh, Highlander and I did the mysterious circle. We were 
utilizing that. But if you think of having eight, eight angles of attack with your tool, your sword, and you have eight angles of footwork, you know, as your delivery system and your escape route plus a circle, um, that's the foundation of everything. And so I, what I like to do is help people see the big picture so they don't get lost in the minutiae because one lifetime isn't enough to learn everything about any art. But, you know, the more art you study, the more you start to go, oh, I I learned this over here. Oh, I recognize this from here. It's just the weapon is slightly different, so the timing and the distance, you know, and the application is slightly different. But what makes it compatibly viable is this foundational structure. Wow, I hope you were writing that down. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, it, it certainly makes sense. I mean, because, yeah, like, like, like I said, you know, you, you have experience instructing hundreds of, hundreds of people, you know, with, with all these weapons and everything, you know, many of which are actors and others are novices. So I imagine everyone is coming into you with a different, uh, with a different skill level, I imagine, and you're having to kind of work with that. I love working with people who have uh, – the more you know, the more fun you are to work with, but it doesn't matter. Everybody's got to start somewhere. But what I do uh, what I do look for is what do you already know how to do? Like if you uh, if you play a sport, I'll uh, – but I get a lot of people who don't. I get a lot of people who, um, for whatever reason – I was not terribly physical. I was very awkward uh, – uh, very unphysical when I decided I want to be an actor. I went, I've got to learn more skills because I want to have more choices. And, you know, the more I can do, the more, uh, you know, the more opportunities I can create for myself. And the, and the nice thing about physical action is you have verbal dialogue. And if you're lucky and get a good author like Shakespeare or, you know, some good playwrights or some good, uh, you know, screenwriters, um, that is enormously helpful. Um, physical action is dialogue to me. You know, it should be subject to the same choices. It should drive drive story and articulate character, or it's it's a bit like junk food. It's not, you know, emotionally um, evocative. Um, it doesn't service the project or uh, the performance um, as as well as you can if you're you know, everything you're doing should be subject to those same choices. What you're looking to do is get is get an audience emotionally invested in your character. You want them to identify with you. You want them to go, yes, I could do that too if I was, you know, um, like Harrison Ford is really good at playing um, an ordinary man in extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> you know, he's, whether he's Jack Ryan or Indiana Jones or, you know, um, he still, he doesn't have superpowers. You know, um, so he takes a licking and keeps on kicking, but you see, you see him, he's smart, you know, and he has heart and, um, but that's, I'm always looking to try, you know, you want, you want the audience to go on this journey with you. So you're, you're, you're looking to, uh, uh, get them to make an emotional investment in you. And when the audience can see you, the character, performing your own action, it gives you credibility, which is priceless. Like Michelle Pfeiffer has no doubles with the whip as Catwoman. That's all her. Uh, interestingly enough, none of the professional stunt women, including Kathy Long, who's five-time world kickboxing champion, none of the ladies came close to her skill with the whip because she probably was trying to give her another vocabulary for her performance. And, you know, and it shows. <laughs> so, yeah. That, that was the ideal. You know, where uh, we were, you know, I was there. She said, I want him on set whenever I'm working because um, I, I built her a foundation. On, you know, I gave her such a strong foundation. We had like six weeks to train um, that we would walk onto the set and look at the um, the obstacles and we would turn adversity into opportunity. I just kind of go, okay, over here, we're going to work in this area and you're gonna we're going to stay in the vertical Okay, but here we got a bunch of crap on the floor, so we're gonna, you know, we're gonna move into the diagonal, the horizontal, or whatever. Or like the uh, the ice princess sequence, we made that up on the spot. Um, I watched a rehearsal. Tim Burton had said, uh, "I don't think there's any whip stuff here." Yet. And I went, "Yes, sir," and I will. So you know, I stood over in a corner and watched them do their first rehearsal, and um, you know, the 
the girl's in the chair and Batman discovers her and you know, Catwoman suddenly appears and cuts her free and, you know, throws the chair at Batman and grabs the girl and leaves, you know, and I said, you know, after the rehearsal, I said to Michelle, you know, if you were to swing in on your on your whip and cut her free and dump her, you know, your chair in one hand and whip in the other says, lion tamer, the world over. You know, and she goes, oh, Tim, you know, Tim Burton, you know, and Anthony's got an idea, and I'm going, oh, great. And uh, so she, you know, she dropped in on her whip. She cut the girl free. She dumped her out of the chair. She cracked the whip. She threw, threw the chair at Batman. She wrapped the whip around the girl, pulled her in for a two-shot, for her line of dialogue, which was girl talk. And we rehearsed it twice and shot it, and we were done. But that's what you can do if you train the actor, and that's 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 what I like. And I like, I like real skills in real time. Um, CGI is a wonderful condiment. It really shouldn't be the entree, you know, um, because, when again, when the audience sees the performer doing something, it gives you a credibility that you can't get when, you know, unless, unless you're a you know, unless you have superpowers, you're subject to the laws of physics. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, you know, look, I know that you have answered uh, questions regarding Masters of the Universe uh, many times, but I, first of all, I have to thank you for contributing to this film. That I mean, I, I grew up, and I t- tell people this all the time, and I'm sure you've heard this from others, but. The Masters of the Universe toy line and cartoon series, I literally was, was raised on it. I mean, I remember growing up on that as a little kid and then seeing the movie at the age of five, six years old was a pretty magical experience. And so the fact that you helped contribute to that, I just uh, have to give you the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate props for it. Did you ever think that you'd still be talking about the film Masters of the Universe 30 plus years later? Um, not so much. Um... It, it's actually, in a lot of ways, gotten more recognition in about the last five years than I think it did in the first 20. Um, I don't think it got the, um, I don't think it got the appreciation it deserved. Uh, it, there were a lot of things that, you know, I had no idea were going on. Gary was struggling mightily with, you know, they were they were constantly trying to shut him down because they didn't have any money. There, were, there was a time when, you know, the whole crew showed up. They you know, they hadn't been paid. They were ready to quit. And, uh, you know, Gary goes, well, we're here. If we can keep working, we'll get you paid by the end of the day. And, you know, his his co-producer somehow says, I don't know where he got the money, but he did. And, you know, and, um, you know, there were there were a lot of things that it shouldn't have had to be that way. But I, I saw it about five years ago at the, uh, at the Egyptian. There was a screening. And uh, I think Gary had come in and uh, – um, uh, girl who plays Tila, um, Chelsea Field. Chelsea, yes, Chelsea Field. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, and, and, um, Robert Tower was there, and, uh, um, oh, the gentleman who, uh, was the production designer, um, oh, Bill Stout. Oh, Bill Stout, yes. And, you know, yeah. Bill Stout, and, and, and it was very nice, and I just kind of went, huh, oh, this, this actually holds up pretty good. You know, I mean, I, I, I had a flood of memories, which is great. And then last year they they did a power con in um, uh, uh, Long Beach, and um, Gary was there, and Meg Foster came in, and um, uh, Chelsea Field was back, and uh, uh, it was and Bill Stout was there, and you know I, again I found out a whole lot more stuff. Um, uh, about you know all the things that have gone on behind the scenes that I had no idea about. Uh, and, and actually, Gary found out a few things about it. <laughs> yeah, you probably didn't know this about my wardrobe or about, you know, the situation or, you know, whatever. So that was really a lot of fun. But uh, we had, um, uh, you know, a great fan turnout and a whole lot of people who, you know, ex- expressed the same thing that you're um, expressing, that, uh, you know, what how important a film it was to them, you know, and, you know, uh, how, how it affected them in, um, you know, such a good way. Val Staples had put this on. He did a, he did a terrific job. Um, I'm, I'm often told that, uh, I guess my, my, but the, one of the only characters that isn't in the Highlander, uh, not the Highlander, sorry, in the, uh, Masters of the Universe, um, uh, lexicon, if you will. He didn't, he didn't exist before the film. 
And I was just so thrilled to be able, you know, I, I mean, one of the questions is, you know, um, the, you know, that, that, that whole speech about I've waited a long time for this and this and that, you know, and did yeah. anybody say anything? Was it in the script? You know, did Gary? And I said, no, I just made these assumptions that, yep, I'm pretty sure He-Man gave me the eye, you know, and I'm looking for a rematch and, you know, and I just, I invested it with, uh, you know, that backstory for me. And Gary, uh, Gary must have liked what I was doing because he, he, he pretty much left me alone. Oh, yeah? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. He just, you know, I would do something and he, he must have liked it because he kept rolling. So, <laughs> and I'm going, okay. Now, were you, were you familiar with the toy line and the cartoon series before the script and the project came your way? So much. I had only, it, it, it was the time um, uh, I was doing a lot of theater at the time, and uh, which was very time consuming. I was working down at the Old Globe, and, and then I was back up here, and I was you know working in Hollywood, and I started working in film. And, I started in theater in '73 at the Old Globe, and I started in film in '75. And um, you know, when I was doing as much as I could in both areas, because an actor is always looking for a job. But it's one of the reasons why I developed these other skills was I've had a whole parallel career as an action coordinator or a fight coordinator or, you know, a weapons expert or whatever, um, you know, because that's why I keep learning because, you know, thing, I, I there were some skills I developed and I knew if I wanted to keep keep growing in those areas, I'd need to learn more stuff. So, and, and I like to learn more stuff. <laughs> so it, uh, and I was I was really always um, oh how should I put this I was always trying to give myself the uh, <laughs> uh, the tools you know for my own performances you know when when I was given the opportunity and you know Masters of the Universe was one of those when I met Harrison Ford he called me up he'd seen my my reel um, you know for Crystal Skull and you know I get this phone call I'm going is this Anthony Delongis yes why does this voice sound familiar. This is Harrison Ford. <clears throat> yes, yes, sir, Mr. Ford. <laughs> well, I guess we better get you in here, you know, to our senior tape and, uh, you know, brush the dust off my whip skills and this and that. I, you know, it's just very cool. And when we, the first day we met, he said, uh, I saw your tape. You're an amazing source. And I said, well, thank you very much. Um, you know, that was kind of my first, uh, you know, skills that I learned. And when do you want to do a sword picture? Alas, he hasn't done one yet, but uh, anyway, it was, it was a lot of fun. Well, the character of Blade is, is you know, one of my favorites. I mean, he's, he's so many fan favorites as well. And you can really tell that you're having a ton of fun playing this particular villain. Uh, you know, I'm curious, the, char- <laughs> the character that is on screen that we see, how much of that did you bring to the character compared to what was written in the script? I mean, did, did you add your own touches to the character of Blade? Oh yes. There were, other than lines, there wasn't anything written in the script. Oh really? Uh, no. Um, I mean, I haven't seen the script in thirty-one or thirty-two years, but I don't recall there being anything other than him. You know, we always look. Uh, I come from you know background of stage, so you always look to the text to see well what clues can I get from the text, you know, and you get okay we're mercenaries, you know, and a curious quartet. And, you know, so you, that's, that's the introduction of the character, you know, and you've got, I've waited a long time for this, you know, so they, we get a sense that, you know, he's had this rivalry with He-Man, but also that, I mean, if whatever the encounter was, he survived it. So there's a certain, I always felt like I taken, you know, um, which is pretty ambitious, you know, uh, but the idea is if, if He-Man doesn't have a worthy adversary, then He Man doesn't get to be He Man, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not Skeletor. Skeletor is, you know, <laughs> beyond. But uh, you know, as 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 another mercy, I I think is a fighter that I can take him. Um, but you know, and I looked and I saw the weapons. Okay, they gave me two swords, you know, and I've got this chain mail, and then I've got all of this crap on that makes it really difficult for you know. It look it looks cool, but uh, I don't know if you knew my you know, you know what my chain mail was made of. No. No, it was 10 six-foot lengths of pipe cut into quarter-inch pieces and then trimmed. So I'm wearing about 50 feet of pipe, probably. 
<laughs> it was heavy, and I and I'm in a uh, surgical rubber suit. So you know, every I would I, once I got the suit on, I wouldn't take it off again until we wrap. So I might be in the suit 12 hours. You know, I, I would peel it down. You know, to try to cool off on certain. You know, when we had a lunch break or whatever. But I would literally pour water out of my boots with my perspiration, like I'm being <laughs> in a river. And um, uh, oh golly, the so but but I looked at it. I had the chain mail. I had the things. I had the projectile. Uh, you know, um, the sort of little you know. Uh, the little rockets, you know, the, the propelled darts coming out of, you know, around my gauntlet. And then I had the, the knives, you know, around my leg that I got to use one. That little moment with, um, oh, golly, uh, he, he, he went on to be Lieutenant Paris and then he pr- produced Chuck. Um, his name just flew out of my head. Who plays Courtney Cox's boyfriend? In each way, there was, there, you, in that moment where, uh, Evelyn, uh, you know, puts the collar on him so that he's helpless. Uh, right. Uh, Robert Duncan McNeil. So, was, so that was the first time I met Robert Duncan McNeil. And then uh, when I guest starred on um, Star Trek Voyager, I played Maj Kala for five episodes. Uh, he was Lieutenant Paris. And then later on, he uh, produced a show called Chuck. And uh, I came in and, you know, <laughs> I got to die horribly on that. that one. <laughs> It was, it was fun. But anyway, in the, in this moment where she puts the collar on him and, uh, you know, he's, he's having to answer. It's like the lasso of truth, if you will. Uh, Gary said to me, give him a little scare, would you? And normally I would never do something with, without telling another actor I was going to do it. But, um, I, I knew I could keep him safe and I wasn't going to, you know, put him in any danger. So when I bury that knife next to his head, <laughs> that that was practical and it wasn't rehearsed. And uh we got a um uh we got a really nice reaction out of Robert Duncan McNeil. <laughs> uh it, but it was also kinda like, okay, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna protect him in this way but also at the same time it's it's gonna be damn scary to have somebody bury a knife eight inches from your eye. But I, I, I take that kind of responsibility very seriously. Now, what was it like working alongside Dolph Lundgren? Oh, Dolph, Dolph, Dolph is terrific. Um, I mean, Dolph's a tremendous athlete, of course. And, um, well, I, I, I got to, uh, Walter Scott was the coordinator. I've worked for Walter a bunch of times over the years. Um, this was the first time. This was when we first met. And then I worked with him again on, uh, Magnus at seven. I came in and staged sword fights for him. And, um, we worked on, uh, Bad girls. I came in and wrapped Madeline Stowe around the neck with the whip, and you know, taught the actor a little bit, and grabbed uh, um, Drew Barrymore in another sequence, which is kind of funny because the camera, I, I had to, uh, <laughs> I had to drop down as as the camera went past me, and then I was essentially doing an over the shoulder, uh, catching her with the whip as she's trying to run away. On the way, so that, and then the last time we worked together was on um, Second Hand Lines. I did all the flashback sword play, which was kind of fun because Walter called me up and he said, uh, "They're trying to. It, this is. Do you know the film? It's Robert oh yeah, Michael Caine and Helly Glass. Yeah, it, it's a delight yeah. with a wonderful message. I'm very proud to be a part of that. But he said they want because it's of memory. It's you know, it's uh, Michael Caine telling Helly Glass when you know this is what it was and we're you know rescuing princesses and all of this sort of stuff but it's from memory so the kid is you know imagining it they said they want it to look like robin hood and the, you know the mark of zorro and i went i can do that <laughs> so i did all the flashback sword action but anyway uh walter was uh the coordinator and there's a very famous stuntman named lauren james who was uh president of stuntman's association he was steve mcqueen's double for many many years like uh on uh, Wanted Dead or Alive, you know, which is kind of where Steve Queen started out. And um, he was supposed to do the sword play, and he, I had worked with him on MacGyver. Um, and he said to me, oh, you know more about swords than I do. You trained off. So I went, okay. So um, I trained off, and he, he and I got along really well. Um, and he, you know, he saw I knew what I was doing, and I was there to help him look great. 
So we got a good foundation going, you know, over about four weeks. Uh, you know, we, we had some rehearsal and stuff. In between while he was, you know, getting prepped and doing camera tests and getting hair extensions and wardrobe and all the things that, you know, you have to do as you're prepping for a movie. And then I didn't see him for almost a month. And I kept saying to Walter Scott, you know, when when can I see the location? Because location is like the third character in any fight. You know, um, like from Russia with Love, where they're fighting in the train car, you know, uh, Robert Shaw and uh, Sean Connery. You know, it's the confines. It's like fighting in an elevator. Or, you know, Jackie Chan is, you know, very famous for, you know, he's fighting under a train or he's fighting on, you know, the ledge of a roof or whatever. So the, the environment is very big in, in, in your choreography, or should be. And I'm going, when can I see the location? He's going, oh, we're going to have all kinds of stuff. Quit bugging I'm going, yes, sir, okay, because um, it was fun, because I was playing my role, but then I had also had the opportunity, you know, to train Dolph and, you know, to choreograph and help Walter, you know, come up with sword action, because, you know, Walter's, uh, that's not his area of expertise, he's a stunt coordinator, um, which means he's responsible for everything, so he, you know, he, he appreciated have somebody who understood swords, you know, on his team. But uh, I said, ah, we're going to have lots of time, blah, blah, blah. Well, we did six weeks of location in Wilmington. What do you think was the first thing we shot on the first night we're down there? The fight sequence. So I had about an hour with Dolph and going, okay, you remember that stuff I taught you a month ago? You know. So we literally threw the choreography together in about an hour. And not the way I like to work, but, you know, <laughs> it is what it yeah. is. Well, the sword, I wanted to ask you, the sword that, that Dolph is using in the film, I mean, it, it, it looks mighty heavy. I mean, and I don't know if it really was or not, but do you know about how much his sword weighed in the film? I used to call it, uh, I used to call it Buick Slayer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> really heavy, a little unwieldy, not terribly well balanced. Uh, Boss Films was putting stuff together, and I don't think they'd ever made um, swords before. Uh, and the swords had to be made because, you know, I mean, this is 31, 32 years ago. Um, you didn't have a lot of good swords. Um, you know, it wasn't something we could rent. And swords weren't nearly as popular as they are now in terms of, you know, reenactors and people doing historical martial arts and, and studying. That's That's really come into its own in about the last 20 years. Um, so they were they were making stuff you know out of aluminum. My swords were pretty heavy, uh, but at least they were sure and their balance was a little better. Um, the grips were a little wide. Um, not, it wasn't the easiest sword to wield, but Dolph's was enormously blade heavy. And you know, a, someone not as strong and, as, and as led, athletic as Dolph wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, but what I had been able to teach him was how to balance the sword in his hand so that by actually you can you can utilize gravity to become an ally instead of an adversary. Um, the sword is supposed to, to balance in your hand. It's supposed to float. The, uh, my favorite analogy for holding the sword comes from uh, an old novel called Scaramouche by uh, an author called uh, Samuel Chalabarger. He, he wrote Captain from Castile and Prince of Foxes and you know, scare motion. Anyway, the guy goes to the fencing master and he says, holding a sword is like holding a bird. You know, if you squeeze it too tight, you crush the life out of it. If you don't hold it hard enough, it flies away. So you have to have, it should be alive in your hand. So that was one of the things that um, I was very pleased I could share with Dolph in how you balance the sword. If you drop your hand, your tip lifts. If you lift your hand, your tip drops. And that, uh, I think, helped him a lot and his manipulation of what was a very unwieldy prop, to be honest with you. <laughs> now, I, I, I know that there was ho there was hope. At least, well, excuse me. I know that there was the um, <laughs> the hope on on behalf of the production team of Canon Films uh, and talk of doing a sequel. Would you have done a sequel if it went through in production? Hell yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but how? Uh, as a matter of fact, if you can get your uh, – there is talk of doing another one. If you if if, if you could uh, ask your fans to please write in and say that they would love to see Anthony DeLonge appear 
<laughs> you know, if not as Blade, then as somebody, but I'd love to come back as Blade, or a couple other people have suggested I'd make a good man at arms. I'm a little older now. but I, Oh, yeah. Uh, you put a weapon in my hand, I still move pretty good. <laughs> well, you were actually, I mean, your character was one of the very few from the film to get an action figure. I mean, technically, oh, I you've, had, you've had two action figures now, because there was the one that came out when the movie came out in 1987, oh, wow. and then they did a, <laughs> it was awful, and then they did a, 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 a remake of that particular figure a couple years back. Well, they used to make figures where you basically changed the head. You know, or, or you change the you know the little plastic dress up armor or the or the you know the accessories that they had you know the the sword or the whatever the weapon happened to be. Um, I think another one of the things just to you know touch briefly on uh, Dolph's sword again the the He Man power sword. Um, when you look at uh, a little bit less so uh, since then. You've had all these video games. I don't care much for it. Although I did enjoy being um, Marshall Lee Johnson in Red Dead Redemption. Um, that was a motion capture that uh, you know, I got to play that role. So it was just because it was a camera, it was motion capture. So it was much more close to. But um, they have a tendency to make the swords larger than life. Like if you look at a lot of the anime stuff. I mean, you've got these swords that are like, oh, my God, you know, that thing's, it's ridiculously large, you know. And um, they had a Conan game that, uh, you know, the uh, Ron Perlman did the voice for. And uh, a friend of mine was playing it. And, uh, oh, my God, the sword's, the sword's twice as big as he is. And, and I think a little bit of the power sword that they made it uh, in epic proportions, um, which made it difficult for Dolph, harder to, for him to wield than it should have been. But again, it, he did it beautifully, you know, a combination of his athleticism. And again, I was happy that I could show him, here's how to get your tool to work for you instead of against you. So that was pretty cool. But, um, um, yeah, so what, <laughs> what, uh, before I went off on that tangent, what was the question you asked me? Oh, just regarding the uh, the action figures that, that came out on your character. First action figure was horrible. You know, it was just like, uh, this is kind of the same figure as everybody else except for this face that doesn't look like me, so they don't have to paint. But, you know, the, you kind of, it had this, you know, like uh, twist action to it. Uh, but, uh, you know, everything was very muscly. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, a couple of years back, um, John Atkins and uh, a couple of other fellas uh, you know, said, well, they're trying to, you know, um, the fans would like a better action figure, and would you help? So I, I did a little video where I was pretending to be, uh, you know, because Blade doesn't die, you know, and, and he just sort of disappears. He gets whacked and falls out of frame. And he was going, he's not dead. He's not dead. Uh, I could come back. But I said, okay, you know, this is Blade, you know, and I'm I'm in disguise, you know, as a uh, – weapons expert and, you know, martial arts teacher in Canyon Country. And, you know, don't let <laughs> – I pulled out the old, old toy and I said, don't let this be my legacy. And, um, you know, I guess that circulated among the fans and they sent it to Mattel and their classic line. So the new one um, – I still don't get any royalties – but the uh, the new one looks like the Blade character. I mean, it's got the, it's got the armor and it's got the accessories um, – like from the film, it, it's it's much nicer, and I have one of those too, and that's pretty cool. Okay, <laughs> you know, my, a buddy of mine. I was talking to a buddy of mine, uh, and he is a huge fan of Roadhouse, and he wanted me to ask you if you, by chance, had any fun stories uh, working on set of Roadhouse. Yeah, lots of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to cost you a bottle of really good whiskey, and you should come <laughs> up and tell you stories. Why don't you guys, uh, you know, get together and come up and train for a long weekend or something? And uh, after we've trained all day with weapons, we'll uh, have a libation out on the back porch and uh, look at the stars because that's what I'm doing right now. Okay, okay, I'll pass that along to him. So, <laughs> does he have any, Does he have a particular thing that he uh, a particular scene he wonders about? Oh, there, there is a whole other fight scene, by the way. Here's yeah, here's one for him. Okay, uh, while. Um, Marshall Teague is fighting Sam Elliott. Um, 
you know, in the bar. Right. Uh, I'm busy fighting Patrick again. But we're just we're just off screen. There's a uh, you know, Ben Gazar sitting over at the bar and uh, Patrick Swayze is next to him. And they had me come in and do this big axe kick, you know, which basically is a vertical kick and you drop your heel uh, onto the top of the bar and shatter this stein of beer that's next to Patrick. And then we go at it, you know, uh, off in a corner. But I guess they figured that I, I, I already had three fights with him. So, uh, you know, they, they were going to focus on the Marshall Teague Sam Elliott fight. <laughs> but, but I'm busy fighting him again, you know. I, I don't seem to learn my lesson in that movie, you know. But I, I had a good time with that. Uh, uh, there was actually when he drags me out, you know, uh, and pulls my boot off and throws it up on the roof. Right. And we start fighting there. Um, he um, he had just come off of uh, the big fight scene with Marshall Teague where he tears his throat out. Okay. And uh, apparently, you know, Mar- Marshall's quite a character. Marshall, uh, you know, was on the teams, and uh, you know, Marshall was uh, all advisor to Mel Gibson was on the first uh, um, Lethal Weapon, um, and uh, yeah, Mar- Mar- Marshall-, Marshall was a great guy and very, very skilled. Um, and you know, of course, he's playing he's playing the psycho, you know, uh, right hand man to Ben Gazzara, and I'm I'm sort of next in line after that, but you know, Marshall, you know. Mar- a little crazy, and they, anyway, they had their big fight. Um, apparently, um, you know, and, and Patrick Patrick was trained by Benny the Jet, you know, Benny Arquitas, a very famous ring fighter. And, uh, yeah, guy, and he he trained he trained Patrick and did a great job. And well, Patrick was was a dancer, he wasn't really a martial artist. Um, he had skills, but you know, so uh, Benny trained him to music, which was kind of brilliant. Um, and uh, but supposedly the story goes that you know before before they had their fight scene, uh, somebody whispered in Patrick's ear, you know, Marshall Teague thinks you're a pussy, you know, which wasn't true. But uh, so you know they they kissed each other a lot uh, to the point where both of them for the next couple of days were limping around, you know, and then then I'm having my scene with him and you know Patrick's wailing away on me and I'm you know and I. I, I took him aside for a second and said, Patrick, I, I don't mind that you hit me in the body. You know, uh, um, you know, I like a little contact. Actually, it helps me react. But please stop driving your fist up under my manubrium, under my solar, solar plexus. You know, <laughs> just hit me a couple inches lower where the muscles are, okay? You know, oh, oh, sorry, man. You know, and then, so we do a couple more tastes. He said, I love working with you. It's like dancing. I'm going, uh-huh. It's an illusion. <laughs> we don't have to beat the crap out of each other. You know, we're telling a story here, man. So there's 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 your story. Well, I've always thought that uh, the playing a villain would just be so much more fun than playing a hero. I mean, w- would you agree? Are, are villains fun? Well, yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I I prefer to say. Well, here's here's a different take on it. Villains don't think they're villains. Villains think they're heroes. Villains think that the rules don't apply to the villains. Think they're special, you know. That um, you know, it's just like it's not my problem. That you know, you, you, you basically, uh, you know, they they're not setting out to be evil. They just they just have an agenda, and the hero happens to be in their way. Um, but I've always felt like if you don't have a strong antagonist, you don't have much of a hero. That was why, you know, when I was facing, um, you know, He-Man, you know, Dolph, and I'm going, okay, I'm I'm his equal. I can take this guy. You know, I've been waiting for this rematch. You know, he he got lucky the last time. You know, um, and if if you don't make the hero dig deep, he's not much of a hero. Um, and you know, you, and the audience wants to see that. The audience wants to see that. You know, uh, there's some adversity here that the what makes him a hero is that in spite of the odds or in spite of the adversity, you know, the, he can he can rise to the occasion and triumph against, you know, against all odds. That's, that's, that's what makes a good story, and that's what, you know, makes an audience stand up and cheer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the fun thing about villains is the rules don't apply. So, you know, you can – and I've, I've had the opportunity to play some – 
very stylish villains, you know, in uh, in Star Trek Voyager and Highlander. I got to play two different, you know, immortal characters. Uh, you know, Blade is one of my favorite uh, roles, and um, I mentioned uh, uh, it was the end. It was the last show of the first season of the original MacGyver. You know, I was Piedra, the assassin. And I came in and I was a master of disguise, and I was essentially a ninja. And uh, you know, at one point, I'm actually holding myself up against the ceiling, you know, <laughs> with my muscles, because <laughs> back then I could. And uh, I ended up, you know, uh, and I did a bunch of different accents. And, you know, it's just, they're a lot of fun, because you can uh, you can be slightly larger than life, you know, and, and, and your job is to give the hero a hard time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have a, an extremely impressive resume. I mean, you, on film, you have squared off against, Dolph Lundgren, Patrick Swayze, David Carradine, Jet Li. Is there anyone out there, any action stars or anyone out there who you have not had a chance to square off against or work with that you would like to? One that you left out of that list is Joe Lewis. You know, Joe Lewis, yes. And Jaguar List. But, uh, yeah, you know, I would, uh, well, it'd be lovely to work with Jackie Chan. I'd love to work with Jason Statham. I'd love to, you know, uh, I just love to work. You know, uh, now... I've been around long enough to where I can, you know, I can either be the antagonist and the bad guy, or I can also be the mentor. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, sort of Chris Christopherson to uh, the other Blade character, you know, or something. So um, I'm always looking for a good role, and you know, I, I, and I bring a few skills to the party too. Are you working on anything else currently at the moment, in addition to teaching? Um. There's always, you know, there's always things that we're waiting to develop. There's always, um, you know, I directed three three Western films of uh, my own, Blood Trail, Trail Home, and a little film called Duke, um, uh, which is it's on Netflix now. Uh, it's an end of life story, which I'm very proud of. Um, that's that's the thing, you know, 45 years in show business, and I still don't know what my next job is going to be. <laughs> but, uh, you know, life is good, um, you know, the, between the teaching and the training. And uh, uh, I do uh, – I love to do voiceover. I do, I do a lot of voiceover. And uh, it keeps my acting chops sharp. And I'm always looking for, you know, an interesting project. So so help me get the word out. Like you say, I, I've done a lot of good work. Yeah, there's, there's more in me. Very cool. Well, hey, Mr. DeLon, just thank you so, so much for uh, for your time today. I really do appreciate it. And I, I think I may take you up on that offer. I'd really love to uh, maybe one day here in the near future, uh, my family and especially my little boy will will come on up. And if we can get some uh, private one-on-one lessons with you, that would be amazing. Oh, so, thank you. Oh, would you tell your listeners, uh, come to my website, which is www.delongis.com. E-L-O-N-G-I-S dot com. And, uh, you know, they'll open a skills page. Have them, they'll open on a bio. Have them go down to the skills uh, section, and they'll see Swordmaster, Whitmaster, Horse Skills, Fights, and Throwing. It, it's, a, it's a fun website. And then people who are interested in training, there is a link on there to uh, Rancho Indala. And we both offer, you know, prof- training for professionals, and we also do kind of an action vacation for uh people who always wanted to train to be their favorite action hero. So to enjoy that sort of opportunity. I, I enjoy teaching because teaching keeps me performing sharp. So and I'm 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 always learning from the people that I train. Well hey, that is awesome. Thank you so much. Um I do appreciate it. Sorry to uh to be long winded, but I, I do I do this was the ultimate honor. So thank you very, very much. My pleasure, Sean. Yeah good uh, Hey you too. Thank you, sir.